But so it's one of the first slides I'm going to go over. Um, so I'm going to be presenting to you the mid year student achievement data. We're going to look at data from last winter to this winter and also from fall to winter. Um, one thing that we've been talking a lot about in the district is the mobility of our students and transfers in and out. So every month we've been tracking the number of students that are transferring in and out of the district. So on the left side of this slide is by month the number of students that have come in and out. September is a lot because that's all the kids that came in even over the summer, not including kindergarten now. Um, so we had 88 kids transfer into the district over the summer and in September that were not with us last year. And we had 43 kids that left the district, um, whether it could have been in the summer or in the month of September, most likely in the summer. Um, on the right hand side, I created a chart by grade level so you can see how many transferred in and how many transferred out by grade level. In parentheses, I put September because that could, again, that was like in the summer. So when we're talking about the kids in first grade or second grade, when we're looking at data, I go back and see how many kids transferred into the district, how many kids transferred out, to the, out of the district in that grade level. So, in looking by month, you can see so far that January, we've had the most kids come in and the most kids come out. So we've had nine come in and eight kids come out. For the district so far, we've had 116 kids enter and 74 kids go out, which is a total of 190 students, which represents about 14% of our student population. So I, when I was, I was looking at the data and I was analyzing the data, I kept going back to our transfer in and out data as well because it's part of our strategic plan where we're looking to work with Lincoln to be able to pull data based on the amount of time that students have been with us uh, for each grade level. So the first thing we're gonna do, take a look at is Dibbles. This is our composite score um, across the board for every grade, K through six. Up here, it looks yellow. The yellow is actually green on the slides. So we, I will combine the yellow and the green because the dark green is the core plus and the yellow, if you will, or light green is core, meaning those are the students that are on level. So again, this is the winter Dibbles data. So at kindergarten, we're roughly 29% of the students being on level or above level for the winter and they gave this assessment in December. So Dibbles was given before Christmas break. Um, in first grade, we're about 41% of the students being on level, 46% in second, 47 in third, and we have a really big jump in fourth grade, 62% of the students are on or above level for Dibbles, 53% in fifth grade and 61% in sixth grade. These numbers comparatively from last year. So the way this pulled out of link at kindergarten is right here. So don't get confused. But the top row is last year winter at this time. The bottom is this winter at this time. So one of the things that um, I was looking at with this information was 
If I look at kindergarten from last year, those would be our current first graders down here. So last year, if we add the green and the yellow together in kindergarten in the winter, it was about 42% of the kids. Um, and now in first grade, we're at 46% of the kids being on level. So you can look at this data in two different ways. We can look at it at different grades or we can follow the cohort and look at it that way as well. Um, sure. This is fall to winter. So this is this year by grade level. So we have kindergarten here. And what I always tell you guys is we wanna see the red shrink and the green get bigger. Um, in kindergarten, we went from 27% of the kids being on level to 29%. In first grade, it was 43% to 41%. 45% in second grade to 46%. And in third grade, 53% to 47. Fourth grade, 54% to 62. Fifth grade, 51% to 53. And in sixth grade, 63% and it's at 61% right now. And you can see some of the reds have gone up as well. And at the end of the ELA data, I'll kind of share with you our takeaways because we dug into all the different subtests and what are the areas that we need to focus on. For iReady Reading, so this is fall to winter um, and it's exactly what we want to see. We want to see all of the green get bigger and the yellow get smaller and the red get smaller. Um, our dark green is our mid to above grade level. Um, if this were just grades three through six, the dark green is what tells us that's the prediction of how we will perform on the state test. So I will show that to you as well in this presentation. Um, but our dark green went up from 11% to 30% and the light green is early on grade level, it went from 16% to 22%. Um, our students that are one grade level below shrunk from 49% to 34. And then our two grade levels below 16% to 9%. And three or more grade levels below shrunk from 8% to 4%. This is comparison for every grade level. Again, this is for reading. So looking at the fall and winter from kindergarten, you can see all of this growth that they have made. Only 7% of our kids in the fall were on grade level and now we have 41% of them at mid or above and 35% uh, at the beginning of kindergarten and 25% are still emerging K. In first grade, there's a lot of growth here as well. Second, third, fourth, you'll see in all of them the dark. And once we get here in third grade, this dark green is indicative of how we will perform on the state test. So when we get our NJSLA results, we'll come back to this data and compare the two. But in years past, they've, they've been pretty spot on. This one is winter by winter. From 1920, now 2021 is not in here because a lot of the students took the assessment from home and the data wasn't really valid, so that was removed. Um, looking at where we are, here we are this year, and this over here is pre-pandemic. So we're edging back to where we were before the pandemic with our levels, our number of students that are on or above grade level, one grade level below, two and three grade levels below. They're all creeping back up to the pre-pandemic le levels. This is for every grade level. For every grade level, winter to winter, you will see that all of our grade levels are trending up. Some are trending up more than others. Um, getting back to those pre-pandemic levels, so 1920, is our pre-pandemic and we want to look at 22, 23 and see if we want to get there plus and get back to where we were plus increase even more. Um, in grade four, the dark green is back to where it was pre-pandemic. Grade five is the dark green is above where we were in pre-pandemic. Grade six is the same. Uh, grade K, one, two and three, they're getting there, but they're trending in the right direction. This slide will compare us. So this is our district here <laughs> compared to the national 
year to date. So the number of students in the country, it's about 7.89 million students in the country take thigh ready diagnostic. And the national norm is the winter of 1819. That's because that was the year pre pandemic that they had all three assessments that they could norm the data. Um, as you see here, we are at 30%, sorry, my eyes. We do better comparatively for on mid or above and early and on than the rest of the nation at this time for the winter assessment. This is by grade level. You can compare each of the grade levels. So every grade except for sixth grade, we have more dark green than the national comparisons. Grade six is very close. Actually, when you take the two greens and you add them together, the early on grade level and the mid, sixth grade is actually above the other nations. Uh, the percentage of students scoring in the red is better than the national average too. So we have less percentage of students scoring in the red than the rest of the nation. iReady has proficiency reports. So they give us, here is what our predicted proficiency will be on the NJSLA. So for third grade reading at the top, if our students were to make no more growth than iReady, 33% would pass the state test. That's what their projected proficiency is. If all of our students achieve their typical growth here, 42% of them will score proficient on NJSLA. And our stretch growth, which is our goal, that's our district goal, that's our teachers, SGOs, everybody's working towards that stretch growth, 53% of them would score proficient on the assessment. So when the NJSLA scores come back, we will come back to this data and compare it. Is it what the heck? <laughs> I guess I was going too long. Maybe nervous. All right. In fourth grade, same thing. So you can see up here, no, no additional growth, growth in fourth grade. Forty-five percent of our kids would be proficient on NJSLA. If our students meet their typical growth, we're looking at fifty-three percent of them being proficient on NJSLA. And if we meet our stretch growth, we're at fifty-nine percent of the students. Um, scoring proficient on NJSLA. In fifth grade, it's the same pattern. So it's 41%, 51%, 62%. 6th grade, 45%, 52%, 62% based on the growth that they make in iReady. So the takeaways from the Dibbles on the iReady mid-year assessments has been that the phonics instruction, instruction is working. Um, it's impacting the data in a positive way. Our oral reading fluency accuracy continues to grow in grades two through six. I'm not even hitting it today. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Our interventionists for ELA um, in grades three through six are actually able to move away from phonics and into the comprehension interventions. So before, if you've been here on the board for several years, we kind of swung the pendulum back to meet the needs of our students with their foundational skills. And we're now seeing all the work that we've been doing paying off with them in those areas. So we're able to start transitioning the BSI support into vocabulary comprehension for literature and informational text. Um, and all of our data is moving towards pre-pandemic levels. Our target areas, K and one phonemic awareness, um, looking to do that more in small group. The phonemic awareness component is in the program that they use, but it's whole group. So sometimes it's really hard to hear individual students actually connect the sounds to the letters. Um, in grades one through three, nonsense word fluency, correct letter sounds is an area of focus and automaticity in phonics skills. So what we're seeing is our students they know their letters, they can do all of those subtests, but it's the one minute timed fluency component where we need to work towards. Um, and then the upper grades, vocabulary, comprehension for literature and informational text will be our target areas. Gonna move on to math. So since we ended with iReady, I figured we'd start with iReady. For math, this is the same. So district wide, you can see our green is much bigger than it was in the fall. Our yellow has shrunk and our reds have shrunk. 
typically we see this in math. We have a lot of growth, even with NJSLA. We grow, we grow, we grow, but we miss the mark on the proficiency levels. And you can see that we have a lot of growth here as well. Here it is by each grade level. So when we're looking at, this is by fall, from fall to winter, and in every grade level, the green is increasing and the red is decreasing overall. So again, it's a little disheartening when we see, you know, 17% in sixth grade at that mid or above, 21% for fourth and fifth grade, 15% in third grade, 15% uh, in second grade. This is winter by winter. So as a district, the dark green is more than the pre-pandemic level. So when I look at the dark green, pre-pandemic, we were at 19% of the kids scoring mid or above level. We're now at 23% of the kids scoring mid or above level. The light green is a little less, 26% to 24. We're trending back up to that pre-pandemic level. And the yellow and the red is very comparative to pre-pandemic levels. This is it by grade level. So in kindergarten, first, fourth, fifth, and sixth grade, you will see that the green has now surpassed pre-pandemic levels. <coughs> grade two and three is trending that way, and it's very, very, very close. Um, in all of the grade levels, the red, the two or more, three or more grade levels below, is decreasing, and that's exactly what we want to see. Compared to the national data, um, we're doing better than the rest of the nation that has taken, and this here for math is 9 million students. So comparing our district to the other 9 million students that took the iReady diagnostic, we are right there and a little bit better than what they did, especially at the <laughs> This is it by grade level. So you can see kindergarten and first grade is better than the normed data in 1819 when looking at that dark green area. All of the grade levels outperform the national data from this year and is trending more towards outperforming the norm data from 1819. Projected proficiency for math. According to iReady, if our students do not show any additional growth, only 21% 20, of them will be proficient on the state test. If we meet our typical growth, 41% of them will be proficient on the state test, and stretch growth, 49% of them could be proficient on the state test. By grade level, fourth grade, we're looking at 19% if our students were not to grow anymore, 29% for typical growth, 44% for stretch growth. In fifth grade, we're at 21% if our students show no more growth, 36% for our typical growth, 44% meeting our stretch growth. Sixth grade, 15% would meet proficiency if we showed no more growth. Only 29% will show proficiency uh, for typical growth and stretch growth, 37% of them would be proficient on the state test. The next part of this is the math interview and MRIs that we give the students as the universal screener. So remember, these are done one on one with the teacher and the student. Um, for kindergarten, this up here will show last year, middle of the year, and this year, middle of the year. So last year, 88% of our students were on level. This year, 91% of our students are on level according to the math interview. For first grade, I compared last year, beginning of the year, to middle of the year. Down here is this year, beginning of the year, to middle of the year, which you could actually look here, kindergarten last year, to kindergarten, or I'm sorry, to first grade this year. So 88% uh, of them in kindergarten a year ago were on level, now 94% of them when we're looking at the math interview. In second grade, 67% of the kids were proficient last year, 68% of the kids are proficient this year. We can take the first grade data here, 78%, and look that there has been a drop. But in first grade, they get the whole numbers assessment. In the middle of the year of second grade, they get the multi-digit numbers. 
numbers because they should have mastered whole numbers by now. So that's why I couldn't compare beginning of the year to middle of the year for second grade because the assessment's different. Looking at third and fourth grade. Third grade, this is the first year we've given the MRI, which is the math reasoning inventory. At the beginning of the year, we gave addition and subtraction. At the middle of the year, we gave multiplication and division, and it also gave us a composite score. So we don't have anything to compare this to because this is the first year that we've done this assessment in third grade. Um, but 68% of our kids being proficient for multiplication and division is really good, especially in the middle of the year when they've just started multiplication and division in third grade. For fourth grade, last year we started giving this assessment in the middle of the year. So across the top, this is the composite score for last year. This is addition and subtraction for last year. This is multiplication and division last year. And down at the bottom, we have our beginning of year and then our middle of year. So this would be the composite. So 50% of the kids were proficient in the fall. Now we're at 49, not much movement here. Um, this is addition and subtraction. 49% of the kids were proficient up to 54. For multiplication and division, it's 47. And it, now we're at 36 or 38, sorry. <clears throat> this is fifth grade winner. So we have from last year to this year uh, because we give a different assessment in the fall than we do in the winter. So in fifth grade in the fall, they take the whole numbers. Starting in the winter, they take fractions and decimals. So from last year to this year, last year 55% of the kids were on level. Now this year, 73% of them are on level. For addition and subtraction, 57% were on level. Now 70% of them are on level. 44% for multiplication and division last year and 68%. So we're seeing that growth. We're seeing the efforts of what we're doing pay off with the math. Sixth grade doesn't get a middle of the year assessment, so I don't have data for them. And then the takeaways. So our positive is a lot of growth. We're trending towards the pre-pandemic levels in all grade levels. Some have already surpassed. Fluency in math relationships is growing in the lower grade levels. Intervention needs are decreasing and the remediation needs are increasing. Target areas, on level and above level students to show more growth. Closing the gaps between our on level students and our below level students. Um, focusing on increasing student accountability, independence and confidence to apply their math strategies independently. And we're not meeting sufficient proficiency levels for the state test. That's clear, that's evident. That's, those are the conversations that we're having. That is all I have. Anybody have any questions? Thank you, Jane, I do have a couple questions. You're welcome. Um, when you compare the fall to the winter on the I read, is that the same assessment? It's, it's, um, it's a diagnostic, so, and it's, that's the word I'm looking for, where it automatically goes up and down. It's adaptive. Thank you. <laughs> it's an adaptive assessment. So it starts them where they ended in the fall. And as they get their questions right, it will get di more difficult. As they get them wrong, it gets a little easier to place them in the right level of where they are. So it's not the same exact assessment, but it's the same type of what assessment. So for an algorithm, it adjusts mm -hmm. in order to put that word into it. Yep. And then when they take that in the fall, are they supposed to be on grade level, or are they automatically on grade level to love because they're taking, uh, you know, they're yeah, third they, grade, they're supposed to be at the third grade level in the fall, or they're supposed to be at third grade level in the spring? They're supposed to be at mid to late at, in the spring. So that's where we look at, I mean, when they come in in third grade, it's going to start testing them at third grade. Not very many of them are going to be on level just entering third grade. Right, so they can be on level at the end. Right, so we really look at the growth from fall to spring. You'll see a lot more growth in the spring than you will in winter. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Rob? Uh, uh, just curious, do you have you or do you put, I'm sure you plan to, if you have share this information with your staff, teaching staff? The curriculum team has really dove into it a lot. We took iReady at the end. We took iReady, it was due in the middle of February. We've sat with the BSI teams and gone through the data because we've adjusted tiers for kids. Sitting with the teachers,
has not occurred at every level yet. The coaches typically take that to PLCs to review with them. I'm curious to see what the teachers' um, suggestions, recommendations, call it, what they feel causes for some of those proficiencies. Yeah, we review it at the. I like the, to know the teachers. Like, I would like to hear what they see as the as the maybe I want to say factor. Factor. Yeah. I'm well, we curious. we did we did a data review of all of this with our DLC, which has teachers from every building sit on that committee, and they each break off and do the different groups. So the takeaways are from them. But that's a small sampling of the staff. Yeah, that's, that is but I know what you're saying. I want to know what the teachers think of the problem. Mm -hmm. Because it's an everyday classroom teacher that that knows. Mm -hmm. Apparently something's not, in my opinion, when you're going to back on the board a few months, doesn't appear that it's gelling. Now, could it still be like repercussions from that horrible year? But the national. Um, it's everybody. It's everybody. And math is across the board, across the nation, and across our state, but also our turnover. I mean, the number of teachers that have left after the school year has started and trying to keep any initiative and training for the different programs going is extremely difficult. Gotcha. I'd just be curious if you ever come up with that kind of, like, give an informal comment from teachers. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Welcome. Any other board member questions? Uh, thank you for the presentation. Thank you. Um, I was normally done as soon as data uh, is available on the website. Yes. Can we go to the next slide? All right, the next slide is on our agenda. Is there a strategic plan update? Uh, this is Worley. This is Tommy. And Tom. Am I committing? Ms. Morley and her associates. Mrs. Leary and Mrs. Seattle is going to work with us today. So we're going to do our update on social emotional learning. Um, I put a couple things in there that we had questions on last time to kind of bring forth some more information towards the board too. And I'm going to be re reviewing those slides. All right. So the members on our committee are a mix of teachers from various grades the counselors from each building, child study team members, parents, and administrators. So those are all the names there. I'm um, Abby Sassione and I'm Lindsay. Okay. And just so you know, we've added, um, Lori Burke is gonna be our parent representative on this committee, and also um, Ra uh, Rochelle Cipinelli from Jampier and Lindsay uh, Gioelli, our counselors. They're both, uh, one's back from attorney leave and one is new to the district, so we've added them in too. Um, so so the, um, the vision of the SEL committee is to meet our staff and students on their level of need and support, um, just all around creating a healthy mindset for the staff and the students. Okay, so one of the things that was on the initial plan for the strategic plan was that there was going to be screeners for the students. So the DOE put stuff out, I, I think it was about, um, 18 months to two years ago that there was going to be screeners. After having training on that and everything, they're not requiring screeners for our level students in this district. So our thought was, okay, so we're going to need some kind of data sources of why are we making decisions here for our students in Franklin Township and what are we going to be looking at? So one thing is, is we really need to keep ourselves up to date on what is happening, not just in Franklin Township, but outside of Franklin Township too, and what is trending as best practice. So the CDC actually released a report providing data on the 10-year trends of behaviors and experiences related to the health and well-being of school-age children. And in this, it says really that connection that's made with staff and students is really valuable to things. And this is a really long report. I put it at the end of this as a link that you could go into. And it gives all kinds of information. But at the core of it, these are the things that the SEL team has pulled out. Staff need to make connections beyond instruction with our most needy of students. And it seems self-explanatory, right? The kid that comes in, they seem sad. They seem like they're not engaged. We need to make that connection. Um, we need to increase school-based services. So here in Franklin Township right now, we have the CCC at Main Road that's giving clinical counseling to students in behavioral support, classroom lessons, 
and we have individual counseling in all three of our buildings. Um, increased school connectiveness, our morning meeting and our mentor program. So right now we have a mentor program at Ritter for many of our students that are needy. That in our plan is that we will move that down to both Main Road and Jambier as we develop through the strategic plan. Morning meeting is across the board in the entire district. Every single class has the ability to have morning meeting model. If it's first thing in the morning, I know in some of the schedules we have mid-afternoons and in Ritter through data we found that some of those mid-afternoons are the check once the kids have kind of their middle school meandered around in the morning and come up with a drama for the day. So providing meaningful professional development on trauma-informed knowledge and practices to staff. Trauma-informed um, we've already we're going to see later in the slides we definitely have some that we've given to staff already but these are and I, I always try to guess my husband I say like do you understand what I'm saying when I do these things he's like what's trauma for kids that have aces aces are things that kids that live in a one-parent household um, kids who have seen uh, domestic violence kids who have drug use in the presence of them these numbers of our students experiencing these are, are rising and in turn, with my next slide, you're gonna see some of our data is showing that. So, so we said as a team, what do we track, right? Because the big question at the DLC and at the admin table, how do you track social and emotional wellness? You can't track how many kids are seen by counselors because all kids should get some kind of counseling or support by adults. So we decided that we were gonna track discipline in the district and crisis situations. So we've observed as teachers, and I have a bunch of them here tonight that can attest to this, that in the past few years that we have seen some really elevated behaviors. Am I seeing nodding heads? Elevated behaviors in our classroom. So in the climate meeting, so each building has a meeting, if it's called the spirit committee or the climate team, we call them different things. In there, we track what our data is with our students. In each building, we look at what are we seeing? What is trending? crisis, aggressive behavior, unkind language, are we, are we seeing a lot of hits going on? And from that, what can we do to support our students? If we're seeing, for example, uh, a lot of aggressive behavior in the building, then our counselors, we need them to go in and support the classrooms and do lessons for the kids on proper behavior with each other, proper socialization with each other. Um, giving our teachers, making sure that our professional development is supporting these types of behaviors that they're seeing in the classroom. You know, I've been in education 22 years. I've seen a lot of different trends that have happened. When I look at what's happening now in the classroom, we're seeing more and more of those ACEs coming into that classroom. We're seeing more and more of kids doing violent behavior in classrooms. Teachers going, what do I do when a kid picks up a desk and throws it across? We need to make sure that we know that our teachers have a plan and we know what to do to support that child. And not just the child, we need to make sure that we're supporting the families because that's where the core is. All right, so our strategic plan update so far since the last time we met. The SEL committee has been meeting bi-monthly. Our school climate teams have implemented positive behavior incentives like First Fridays, Best Version of You tickets, and Copy and Go to the Bus. The SEL committee has planned monthly events for staff and students, and there's a calendar link there. Uh, we've planned professional development for staff, like Mrs. Morley said, the PD on trauma and foreign practices we had. Uh, we provided lunch for all the staff on the January PD day, as well as infused a scavenger hunt that day. Uh, we had PD on threat assessment, threat assessment and crisis screening, both in November and January. Our subcommittees within our SEL committee have been meeting for professional development, calendar development, and meeting planning. And we've also been meeting to review SEL curriculums, and then the strategic plan update is attached has that information. Yes. Um, at Main Road, we have the Child Connection Center, or the CCC. Um, it's a school-based counseling program that helps students learn important skills, such as self-regulation, social skills, and problem-solving skills. They're, the programs are individualized for each student and family. Um, they can cover topics such as self-esteem, friendship and relationship issues, behavior management, stress management, fears and worries, um, academic progress, conflict, conflict resolution, social skills, and or adjustment to school. Um, currently, there are 32 students that are receiving counseling services weekly. Um, two, of, two students are receiving behavior intervention supports. 
um, which that makes up approximately 11% of the student body at Main Road. Um, teachers are also consulting with the CCD, CCC team uh, for classroom culture and support. Um, I know they've been going into classrooms also doing different types of um, lessons on whatever our character trait of the, the month may be. I think this month they're coming in and doing honesty lessons in the classrooms um, just to help support the students and the teachers as well. So then our steps moving forward as we continue with the committee. Uh, we want to continue to plan district-wide events to support both our staff and our students. We're going to review the SEL curriculum options that we have with the entire committee and compare it to current standards. We're going to keep our communication open uh, between our committee and then each of the school level teams that Mrs. Morley was talking about. We're going to continue providing PD for staff on positive verbal and nonverbal language in the classroom. And then the trauma informed practices part two is coming. We're going to continue to update our web page and display school events as they take place so that you can see what's going on as well. And then, uh, Mrs. Morley touched on this, but the Department of Ed doesn't recommend the screener, so uh, we're going to review our threat <laughs> and suicide assessment forms to compare them to the new requirements that were put into place. And then we're going to continue to review and update our SEL website link as needed. And then those are the resources. Yep. Any questions? Um, I do have a question. Absolutely. Um, the, for the kids, I, I understand how we're trying to address the kids that are having issues. What are we doing to address those students that are in those classrooms where these aggressive behaviors, tantrums, outbursts, wherever may be occurring? Because their educational day is being interrupted. Correct. So we have procedures set in place if a child does have an outburst of, and depends on the level of it. Um, the CPI team is trained in that for them to go in. I mean, our, our goal, yes, is to get that child back into the classroom. Sometimes that's not um, where it is, but we have behavior plans that we put in place. Um, the, like I said, the counselors are able to go in and support the other students if it's necessary, supporting the teacher. A lot of times it's classroom management plans, going in, having a behavioralist observe the child. Well, no, I'm not speaking about the child, I'm speaking about the other kids, the other students in that classroom. Right. Because they're being affected by those behaviors and they're consistent to agree. Their education is being interrupted and they're being affected. We're trying to min minimize that by making sure. Are we in any way, shape, or form communicating with parents when these outbursts are occurring in the classroom so that they're aware that this happens in their child's classroom and maybe you want to speak to them or if they hear something at home about it? I mean, if it's an individual basis, if that's a necessary thing, we can't discuss another child's oh, discipline or another child's actions. I can speak in my building. Um, that hasn't come to the committee as something for us to do, but in my building, if there's an incident like that, usually what a recommendation would be to have a morning meeting after that to discuss how we're going to move forward as a class. We've often had counselors come in and meet with the class if something that's happened to talk to the students individually if kids are upset over it yes i've definitely reached out to parents and said things have happened usually the teacher level does that because like of dojo and things like that and quick communication depends on the level i can honestly say michelle as a whole um usually it's a smaller class that things like that happen to at my level at the lower level i know when we're in kindergarten Sometimes that's a little bit different, but having that meeting with the kids and making sure that they're okay, and then, yes, communicating to the parents that there was something that happened in the classroom. If it's specifically to other kids, because sometimes an outburst could be to another student, that would need a phone call. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Can I just make a comment? Yes. I just want to commend you guys. I truly feel that our kids can't act up and grow until their social and emotional needs are met. I think they're the phenomenal job. So. Yeah, I, I'm thinking, thank you so much. My team is awesome. I think when Barb asked that question earlier about the data, when you asked that question, like why, I think this is a huge part of it. I think it's a huge part of it. A lot of our kids aren't coming to school, especially in the lower end, ready to learn. I think they're coming with a lot. Um, and I think that giving them the feeling of a safe place that they can learn in and building that relationships. I think anyone, I see a lot of educators at our table here, um, you know that a kid's data is gonna grow further when you make that connection with that kid. And that doesn't matter what level they're at. Making that connection 
and that child will work as hard as possible for you. So thank you so much. Any other questions? Thank you. Hi. Uh, I had a question for you. Uh, this that session's been closed. Your initial slide referenced the data that's been following for the inputs and outputs of the students in the district. Who who are these children, and why are they coming? Why are they going? So part that's part of what we're tracking too. One of Troy's secretaries, there's different codes when students leave. Are they going to another school in New Jersey? Are they moving out of the state? Where they take, you know, is it a DCPMP placement? When they're coming in, also tracking all of that. We have a big spreadsheet that we look at every month for those reasons. Um, so we have the ability to go back and pull it out that way too. But there hasn't been enough of a trend yet to see exactly where they're going. I think I've been this in a previous meeting, but we don't have historic data on that. It would, over the last 10, 15, 20 years, to know not pulled out the way we're doing it now. Whether or not this is to, you know, Mrs. Morley's point, she said they're, they're seeing an uptick in these behavioral issues. Is that a direct correlation to what we're seeing in the, the movement of the population? Or no, if you, look, if you look at the students coming in, um, the transfers in, they're not the ones who are in, indicating they're homegrown. They're not ones that are indicating coming out. Not all cases. We have some that are, that are coming in, but not the majority. Right. Yeah, that's, that's something that we have lacked academically. A lot, of, a lot of the kids that come in do go right into a tier two or tier three. Yes. Because they are below level. Well, you clearly see an uptick in these behavioral issues that were assigned here. Yes. Yes. That's what made us start tracking the discipline things across the district to start to see what behaviors were, were seen. It's a little bit difficult um, when it when it comes to looking building to building and things like that because behaviors in Henry's building is a little bit of age appropriateness too. So when kids come into kindergarten, you see kids that just they're kindergartners. They like social, social skills. Well, you made a reference to kids picking up desks and throwing desks across the room. I did. And I tried to think back to my last year in school. Mm -hmm. and I don't did you see any desks I mean, because anybody's going to throw a desk is within me. I don't know if that's a good idea. And I don't, I don't ever remember experiencing that. So it's, it's concerning to me yeah. that you're experiencing that. It's also, it's also sad to hear that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, doesn't sound like any of us know exactly what the answer to that is, um, but it's just, you know, it's, it's unfortunate. Yeah. It is. It is unfortunate. I, I have to. I have to commend the growth in the, in the teachers here, though, in their ability of de-escalation strategies. We spent a lot of time with professional development in the last couple of years of giving them the tools to de-escalate kids, um, and I think that we've seen a lot less. With our teachers being able to do that, but that I'm sorry, Jason. No, I, um, I think I think that we're seeing behaviors coming in that are alarming, and the numbers of them are alarming. But this is this is a nationwide thing. This is no different than the school down the street. This is, um, you know, people can say it's technology. People can say it's uh, the home life. It, it, people can say it's the schools. Um, I think it's kind of all of the above. Right. So I think giving them that, that positive language in the classroom too, when a child is escalated, um, to be able to talk to them, to have that relationship with them. It's hard to measure what a relationship is, but uh, I'm going to tell you, when you have that, you're able to get a kid to calm quietly. So like what Michelle was saying was, you know, how about the other kids too? Using that positive language on a daily basis, creating that culture, making sure there's yeah, and that's also a concern of mine that, you know, clearly we want to give as much resources as we can Absolutely. to have children that are struggling. However, we can't search so many resources to those individuals that we've ever looked 
the other individuals. You're absolutely right. Them. So I'm sure that's a constant balancing that, that you guys It is a constant balancing act. Yeah, uh -huh. and I'm not, I'm, you know, that's why I always say my own guilty on it. Like, I fight too hard for some of them and not for others. But yes, right. like, yeah, I know what you're saying. Yes. Uh, that would have been inferred some Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yes. Yeah. Um, with that, I will open our first public comment section. Um, for agenda items, I have to make a motion to have the public comment section. Second. All favor? Uh, aye. That is the uh, Anyone from the public wish to uh, step forward and comment this evening on the items on our agenda? Okay, that's one individual, please. Step up. Hi, my name is Tammy Bozak. I live in Franklin Township. I've had two kids that have come through our district who have had amazing teachers. And I just want to kind of point out between Ms. Dolan's presentation and the SEL, I've been teaching 24 years. This is what it is. The way we fix this is our teachers. You need teachers that have been here for more than a couple of years. It takes a long time to get comfortable. It takes a long time to know how to do that and to do it well, to be able to do your teaching and your learning on top of the discipline and the behaviors. Your teachers are not respected here. And until you respect your teachers with the way they're treated and their pay, you're gonna keep getting new teachers, you're gonna keep losing teachers, and none of that is gonna happen. It's really what it comes down to. You have to keep your teachers here so that they know what they're doing so they've been around a long time and they can really make things happen. Yes. Uh, 
Carissa? Yes. Michael? Yes. Fellas? Yes. Sally? Yes. Jim Lady? Yes. Orlowski? Yes. Cunningham? Yes. Craig? Yes. Coach and Harris?
address a few issues about which there seems to be misunderstanding. First, at the Jambir meeting, Sue Buryak, our TFEA president, made a statement regarding an attendance memo sent by Mr. Walton. She simply was express expressing morale and health concerns that caused amongst all employees of Franklin Township Board of Education. After her statement, she was threatened by Mr. Cassese with an unfair labor practice charge. At last month's meeting, several teachers read statements from some of the teachers who had left the district. These statements were sent to our action committee by those teachers. After the meeting, the TFEA was accused by certain people, not any of the board members, uh, that these statements were untrue and fabricated. I'd like to verify that these statements were factual and that they simply wanted the members of the board to understand that there's more than money that's causing people to leave our district. Finally, <clears throat> at the February Board of Education meeting, specific details regarding negotiations were brought up. While this information shouldn't have been brought out in public, I would like to bring clarity to the percentage increase that was mentioned. The members of the public should understand what the Board of Ed understands, that whatever percentage is agreed upon in contract negotiations does not go to every teacher. For example, if the end of the process the TFEA and the Board of Ed agreed to a 4% increase. Not every teacher will get that 4% increase. The 4% is, um, is an increase over the prior amount of teacher salaries. And that amount is divided amongst all professional uh, staff. To imply that any professional would turn down a large percent percentage increase is misleading and unfair to the negotiating process. In all my years as chair of the negotiating team, this is the first time that any board president has ever brought up specific details of the contract pr proposals. In closing, we're asking for fair and equitable contract settlement and respect from the board, the superintendent, and the administration for the educational professionals in our district and for the negotiating process. Thank you. Issue, we can certainly agree on that. 
Well, we, I do agree with that, but what I don't agree with is that no one had the background that we had in the negotiating process. And I think some, especially those who may be watching this, don't understand about salary guides and what the initial proposals were. Okay, there's more than just a salary guide, and you know that in the proposals. Well, every, every single board meeting that we had, I update the entire board on the process of our negotiations. Now, why you did not update your entire association Oh, we're updated. So. We're updated. Oh, they're updated. Where's the update? Well, the <laughs> uh, fact, we had. Well, why is there an issue about making public? You just stated that your own association doesn't understand a salary guide. So. Yeah, well, I said that's what you just stated. No, we had a salary guide. Our percentages are not public. Uh, wait, wait, are you referring to the general public? Yes. So you don't want the general public to know? Well, no, apparently it's videos, so they know right. what if they don't understand what that 5% meant. I mean, they probably thought that a teacher that we're, we're being really greedy, not taking a 5%, not knowing what that comes down to, and what, no, not knowing what we are supposed to give back to get that money. And we had Greg Gordy out here, and he explained everything. He put the board um, salary guide as opposed to our salary guide, the one we proposed. So everyone understands, correct? Yes. And we're very transparent with our members. But we want to make sure that everyone understands exactly what's in these proposals. Well, that's, that, that's all the time to the information I've got from some of your membership, because after the meeting last month, I, I went to one of your members. I said, "What is the problem with the salary guide that we proposed?" And that member said, "I don't oh, know. I've never seen the salary guide that you proposed. That's just not how we handle negotiations. That information is not shared with the general uh, group." Well, we uh, we usually don't until we agree on something. I mean, this is usually between the TFEA and the board. Because, like I said, there's more to it than a salary guide. And you know that. You know it was in the proposals. And I'm not going to get into it now because there's too much to get into. And I think it would be very unfair and very unprofessional to start talking about negotiations in front of people that don't have um, that knowledge. Well, that's fine. But when you come out, you the whole time does to say, fair pay for, for teachers teacher say you uh, working without a contract so that's all negotiation so if you'd like to make it public that's perfectly fine with me like I said we can make the entire negotiation problem public I prefer that every single one of your members would show up to it too because I'm tired of coming to negotiation meetings and you not being able to negotiate and telling me that you can't make a decision uh, on anything without no, going back I, to your entire membership. No so, I involve my membership we only speak for our membership we don't decide what they want they tell us what they want. And then that's what, uh, in a negotiation meeting, that's what I let you know, exactly what the membership wants. And I tell you what would pass, what wouldn't pass. Okay, so. Disagree on, on the part of negotiation problem. <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, good evening. My name is Beth Almer, and I've been a teacher at Ritter for the last eight years. Um, recently, I watched a colleague, an experienced, dedicated, amazing teacher, tell the kids in my homeroom that she'd taken a job in another district. The kids were understandably sad to hear this news, but after a minute, one of my students said, you know, whoever replaces you will be the fourth new teacher that I've had this year. Other students, um, other students chimed in that they would be on their third new teacher, their fourth new teacher, their fifth new teacher this year. In this school year alone, we've had 10 classes of Ritter students who've been impacted by teacher turnover and change. To put it in perspective, there's a student at Ritter who has had seven new teachers since the beginning of the school year. That's, in fact, that student has had new teachers in all major subject areas except for one. Certainly, this has had an impact on the continuity of educational services for our students, and this information doesn't take into account the students impacted at Main Road and Janvier as well. Um, while teacher retention is an issue throughout the country, this is all the more reason to work to keep our teachers here for the good of our students and the good of our community. 
In a recent TFEA survey, only 23% of the members who responded to the survey said they planned with confidence to return to the Franklin Township schools next year. To put it in number form, of the 107 teachers who responded to the survey, 25 plan with confidence to return to Franklin Township in the fall. There are lots of reasons why teachers leave, but money and the equitable division of it plays a large factor. A contracted teacher at Delcy teaches 1,230 student instructional minutes per week, while a teacher at Franklin teaches 1,450 student instructional minutes per week. At Delcy, a first year teacher makes $53,993 versus the $50,405 they make at Franklin, a $3,588 difference. A teacher who has taught 10 years at Delcy makes $69,883 versus the $54,405 that they make in Franklin, which is a $15,478 difference. A teacher who's taught 15 years at Delcy has reached the top of the pay scale and makes $89,334. A teacher at Franklin in year 15 makes $62,620, a $26,717 difference. That Franklin teacher also has to teach four additional years to reach the top of the pay scale before reaching the top at Franklin. These numbers are offered simply as a comparison to represent the disparity that exists between educators within the same community. We teach the same kids and we work with the same families. As elementary teachers, we lay the foundation for the academic successes of the students in our community. Our students and our community deserve teachers who stay and who are compensated fairly, both at Delcy and at Franklin. I support our negotiations team. They speak for me and my fellow teachers. They are our voice. Please settle with a fair and equitable contract. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Stacy Swilp. I'm a fourth grade teacher at Main Road School. I'm both a teacher and a parent. I reside in Harrison Township um, with my four boys who are 20, 19, um, 16, and nine. And I just wanted to bring up a few things tonight because I know the Board of Ed, I've heard them say that they're trying to attract new talent to this district. And my question is, how do we plan on keeping that new talent in this district? It's like our house is on fire here. This is an alarming rate of turnover in this, in this district that I've never seen before in my 23 years. And I don't think it's any surprise that the teachers are having this mass exodus. Um, this is my 23rd year teaching here. As I said, I had my master's degree and at the top of the pay scale with a master's degree, I make $84,103. Just for comparison purposes, and it did take me 10 years to break 40,000 in this district, by the way. Um, but for comparison um, purposes, if I was at Del C at the top, I would be making 91,000 compared to the 84, which is a $7,000 difference. So just after three years at the top, that's a $21,000 difference. And the top of Delcy's pay scale, it takes them 15 years to reach the top, where in this district, it takes us 19 years to make it to the top. So I did a little more math. And over the course of five years, there's a $50,000 difference in comparison to us, to, my, to the Delcy counterpart. And looking at steps, step by step, from step five to 15, their top, and Franklin Township step five to 15, the difference is $166,000, just from steps five to 15, comparing salary guides, step by step, and adding it up. Over the past five years, I've had an increase of anywhere from 0.48% to 0.71%, less than 1% increase, at times less than half of a percent increase. The current rate of inflation is 6%. So as the cost of food and fuel and utilities and cars and homes and 
my son's college tuition continues to increase, my pay is stagnant and many of the steps on this scale, as you know, remain stagnant. So again, I pose the question, if we're trying to attract new talent to this district, how do you propose we keep them? Because when I talk to other teachers, as we do, and I look at other contracts, not just Delcy, various contracts, we always come up short, always, always, always. Um, we come up short for prep time. Most districts get five to six preps a week given to their te teachers to allow for ad adequate planning time. We get five preps but lose one to have PLC meetings. So it's four preps a week. In reality, our lunch time is generally shorter. We have no recess aids. I substituted over 25 years ago in college, and even then I did not have recess duty at various districts in the county. So lunch ended up being 45 minutes because they hired recess aides to handle all the nonsense at recess, and teachers could then be in their classrooms preparing for their classes. And now we require a doctor's new. And I just think as a new, a new hire, I would not stay. If I knew in another district, I could have better pay because we are the lowest paid in the county and I wouldn't have to produce a doctor's note every single time. I'm sick because anyone who has ever been sick knows that sometimes you don't need to go to the doctor when you're sick. Sometimes you just have a sore throat. And as a teacher, we've got to be on. I mean, all day long, a good teacher is enthusiastic, energetic, engaging. And from the time I hear the sounds of those little feet pitter pattering down the hallway from the time they exit the building, you've got to be on. We don't have a job where we can close the door and sit at a desk and kind of take it easy. So that's another a downside to this district. So I'm just wondering what you're going to do to try to keep this new talent you're attracting. Um, and in closing, I'd like to say I fully support and with gratitude, I thank our awesome negotiation team who is working so hard and tirelessly on our behalf. And they um, do speak for me and for our membership. And I have full faith when we finally have a fair contract on the table that they will then accept it. Thank you for listening. and I am fully prepared and I'd like to now address you. So we do not have these incredible jumps at the last contract we did attempt to burst a little bit that bubble. I know what you're referring to. I've been here 23 years. So I, I have made it to the top, but my increase is 0.48 to 0.71% in the last five years. So I'm not getting a big increase either. Well, again, yeah, obviously, you know what else is true? That top step will affect us the rest of our lives as we collect a pension. So they're gonna take our top three years of payment, of, of salary. So it, let's not be short-sighted. It's not just what are we making at step five or six or seven. More importantly, after we retire from Franklin Township, what will our pension be the rest of our lives? That actually is the long-term the long game. And you said that you know, you're know you trying to put more money at steps one to 10, and I've heard you say that at other board meetings. But the new staff, they're, they're not dumb or ignorant. They're able to read the entire salary guide from step one to 10 and on to step 
18 or however many steps you're trying to add to the salary guide. And they're going to see when they get to where I am, my raise is anywhere from $400 to $700 in the past five years, 0.48% to 0.71%. Why would they stay in a district with no longevity pay? Most districts have longevity pay, but not in Franklin Township. So why would a new hire stay? Why wouldn't this not just be a stepping stone district and they would get three years here and move on instead of rewarding our veteran and seasoned teachers who are more knowledgeable about the curriculum, best teaching practices, and classroom management. You're going to lose those season so members. Now you're against putting money in step one pen. Oh, I'm not against putting money anywhere because this whole district is underpaid from steps one through 18. The, the whole the contract is broken. The salary guide is broken. I absolutely, I 100% agree with you. The salary guide is completely broken, and that salary guide is 100% responsibility of your association. Okay. This is this board. The board has never pushed back the salary guide. Same world. That's same world. Same world. Same world. That salary guide's been around before, I'm sure any of us were even here. And at the last contract, they did attempt to bust the bubble. They did insert seven a step after 17 to do that. Uh, move forward to try to correct it in your association or not. They did share the salary guys. Any any teacher who wanted to learn about salary guides, it was presented at a very detailed meeting last month. So any any member who wanted to attend, they could. So if they chose not to attend, when you spoke to a teacher who did not know, they choose not to know. I choose to go to the to our leadership and ask questions and attend the meetings. So if you want to know, you can be in the know. So no, I'm not against putting money at steps one and ten. I'm just saying you you can't expect teachers to be so short sighted that they're going to think I get a decent increment now, but then they're, they're not going to see it step eighteen. Now they're getting a four hundred dollar raise, and that will affect them the rest of their lives as they collect pension. So more money has to be dispersed throughout the salary guide. To, so we're not the lowest paid in the county. Were there any further questions? Yeah. Thank you. Hi, I'm Tasha Bowman, fifth grade teacher, TFEA member, and member of our community. I'd like to provide some background on myself for those of you who don't know me. My first career was in marketing in a corporate world. It was a fast-paced, very high-paying job. The days were long, but at the end of the day, the work stayed until I came back the next. As great as a job that was, having children of my own made me realize that I was looking for a change. In my early 30s, I went back to college to pursue a dream of being a teacher. I worked full time while raising my three daughters, all while going back to school. This by no means was easy, but I persevered because I knew this was the career that I was meant to have. Fast forward eight long years, and I successfully earned my master's degree in education. Starting a new career so late in life had its challenges, but being able to do my student teaching, work as a substitute, and now being a fifth grade teacher all in my hometown made it easier. I was so excited to experience all of these things in the district I attended growing up. And I'm sorry if I'm emotional, but this is how much I care. Working in the town where you teach is not for everyone, but for me, it makes it that much more rewarding. I truly do love when I run into my families around town, and I love that I'm close enough to be able to support my students at all their different sporting events. I'm sharing this with you because I want you to understand how hard I've worked to get to where I am today and how much I value working in this district. I love being a teacher. It was what I was meant to do. I love our town, and I do love our children, some of your children. But I also love myself, and I know that I deserve better. Our district prides themselves on being a family, but it hasn't felt like a family in a really long time. A family is supposed to be supportive. A family should respect each other and should work together to help each other. In the past seven years that I've been at Ritter, I've accumulated 70 plus six days, 10 per year for each year that I've been working. To this date, I have 64 and a half sick days left. In the past, I've been awarded perfect attendance. The last two years have been more challenging to maintain that with COVID and other illnesses. 
In fact, I was just out sick last week with symptoms that I had previously ignored or pushed through for well over a month. With having so many sick days left, you can see that I'm not a repeat offender. I do not like missing work and not being there for my students. I also do not like that my family required proof that I was in fact sick. I won't deny that this policy can be abused at times, but it was extremely disheartening to have received a request for a doctor's note when I'm hardly ever absent. I can assure you that I would much rather be in school than not. It's not easy to take a sick day. Teachers still need to provide detailed lesson plans and create and post assignments. I also personally check in with my students when I'm out, as I know sometimes the simple absence of a teacher can have an impact on their day. My children have gone through our school district. One is heading into her senior year of college, one will be college bound in the fall, and my other daughter is now in seventh grade at Delcy. I'm proud of the education that they've received here in Franklin Township. My students, whom I love like my own children, deserve to have the same quality of education. And to have that, we need teachers to stay. And for that to happen, we need to fairly compensate our teachers, and we need to to get back to being like a family. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Melissa Van Dyne. I am a TFEA member. I am also a former community member, and I was one of your students not that long ago. Um, I've been working in Franklin Township since 2013. Prior to that, I was a dedicated substitute um, within the district. Uh, currently, my weekly instructional minutes are 1,450 minutes, and I'm currently compensated at 57,405. Um, I have a master's degree, uh, plus 30, um, and if you're not quite sure what that means, I am dual certified. I have a degree in history and political science as well, and to top it off, I also have my reading specialist certification. If I worked at Delcy School District, my weekly instructional minutes would be 1,230 minutes, and I would be making $72,883 on the same step. Thank you to my negotiations team for speaking to me, uh, uh, speaking for me, and thank you to the SEL team because they're keeping me here. They're helping me stay in this district. Thank you. Sorry, I thought you were gonna answer a question. Hello, my name is Mia Moroz. Um, I'm a TFEA member. I've been working in Franklin Township since 2015. My weekly instruction minutes are 1,450 and I am currently compensated at 52,705. If I worked in the Delcy School District, my weekly instructional minutes would be 1,230 and I would be making $63,000, uh, or sorry, 63,083 on the same step. Like everyone who spoke before me, I support our negotiating team, and I also really enjoy working in this district, but my daughter started kindergarten this year, and I look at all the things that her school district, uh, the, um, their teachers are given like every month, and their compensation, and just, they seem like a family. And it's really hard for me every day to see these things, and still continue to want to be part of this family. So again, thank you to the TFEA because I support you and everyone here does. Hello, I'm Jenny Riggioni. I'm a TFEA, mem TFEA member. I've been working here since 2009. My weekly instructional minutes are 1,450. I am currently compensated at 56,000. $762. If I worked at Delcy, my instructional minutes would be 1,230. I would be making $77,175. It's $20,000 more with my middle school certificate across the street. When I went and just quickly looked at our salary guide from 2020, the 2021 to the one that we're currently frozen on, I personally could not find any step that had that 20% increase that was mentioned earlier. At most, I could see a 7% doing the quick math. I would like to say that my negotiations team has been transparent with me and my members from the beginning of this process. If I have questions, 
They are right there to answer them. They provide me with all of the information from the start. I have access to anything that I need to understand and they negotiate on behalf of me, on behalf of my TFEA, TFEA members. I trust them and I'm looking forward to moving forward in a positive way with transparency from all to settle for a fair contract. Thank you. Mm -hmm. what, what part of that you objected? I do not feel comfortable speaking, speaking publicly about your private conversations publicly. So I would like to, I would like for you guys and my negotiation team to have those conversations. Why, why do so many of your members keep mentioning how many instructional minutes? What's the relevance of that? Because of, because it's important. Because we are doing comparables and what I work and what I'm compensated at compared to another district that services the same community. But it's part of our contract. I'm contracted to work 1,450 minutes. Delcy is contracted to work 1,230 instructional minutes. So you have no input on the proposal? I don't think that is my place. I give my opinion to my negotiation team and they negotiate on behalf of me. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Christina Lott. I've been a teacher for 11 years here, 18 years altogether. Um, I was just going to read this little statement <laughs> that says, I 100% support my um, union team, and I made this sign. <laughs> and I was ready to just um, listen to all these beautiful people who, who prepared these statements on behalf of us teachers. Um, thank you to the SEL committee because that is what I'm, I, I'm trying to hang on. Um, like our uh, member said, uh, we are 90% theater <laughs> throughout our day. As she's absolutely right. The minute those kids come in, I have your daughter, I had your son. Like I respect this job. I cannot see me doing any other job. Believe me, I've done the Google search. What can I do with a teaching degree other than teach and that I think would surprise you because I was born to do this and I'm struggling because I stay with the kids and I'm so happy. I'm so happy. And then I come here and I can't believe you're talking to, to us in the tone and, I, and we're so calm and we're just saying, listen, could you please listen to some of the concerns that we have and we're listening to your side too because my son's got an argument about what they wanted to watch on tv and i sat with the one and i said what would you like to watch and he told me why and then i talked to the other son and i said what would you like to watch and he told me why and we had a conversation i didn't yell at them they didn't yell at each other it was a civilized conversation and he brought up points and my other son brought up points and as a teacher and as a mom I knew how to handle that and we are teachers and we are willing to work with what you you give us but you have to understand maybe we have some questions or we're going to give back it is not a matter of we're wrong and, and we're holding it up and it's all because of us we trust them completely and we're so thankful that, that they're standing up on our behalf and we're going to work every day with smiles on our faces this doesn't come into my mind when i'm in front of the kids i'm 100 110 percent on every single day because they are my world other than my own kids just like tasha said so thank you for listening to us we really really appreciate it that's why we're here is to have that conversation and let you know how much we care and we appreciate you caring about us as well thank you hi good evening my name is kathleen reber um, i'm also a tfea member I just wanted to say that I do support our negotiations team. They do speak for us. We're very grateful for them. Hello, I'm uh, Chrissy Rambone. I am a TFEA member. I've been working in Franklin Township since 2003. My weekly instructional, instructional minutes are 1,450 compared to 
the fewer minutes of 1,230 that I would have to work at, uh, at the Delcy School District. Um, the uh, difference in salary is about uh, 15,000 at, at the same step. Um, at, at step 15 for Delcy's salary guide, which is the top of their salary guide. And um, like, like all of my members, I fully support my de negotiations team. Thank you. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Lauren Lascala. I've been here for about seven years uh, in the district. Um, I originally had one of the prepared statements that you've already heard, but um, I am not going to read it because I kind of feel like speaking from the heart might be the better way to go here. Um, Lord knows I am not a math teacher. I am an ELA teacher, so I'm also not going to talk numbers. <laughs> what I am going to say is that, you know, like most of my colleagues here, I do feel like I'm a very respected member of the Franklin Township Teaching Association. Um, you know, I, I serve as team leader for my, uh, my grade five uh, team. Um, I'm on the SLC, uh, I'm on the DLC. Uh, I come in and I, I feel like I have uh, a lot of value in those. Um, I, I currently am on step 15. Um, it's gonna take me with the current salary guides about four more years to get to the top. But my concern is when I get to the top, where do I go from there? Um, that's, that's my struggle. And I've heard a lot of, a lot of talk about you know, pushing money where it needs to go, getting new hires in, and I completely agree with that. We, we need some fresh meat. We need some people who've got some really fantastic ideas, but are how are those people, those novice teachers coming in, going to learn if they don't have the expertise of your veteran teachers there to support and guide them? And that's just what I think about um, when I come here and I listen to all of this. So, you know, I, I'm really glad that um, my team, my negotiations team, you guys are amazing and we really support you and, you know, want to thank you for the job that you've been doing. You've been hearing us um, and, you know, keep pushing it. So, thank you very much, board, for seeing Hi, Denise Wagner, Township Resident, um, Technology Teacher at Moon Road School. Um, I've worked here for over 25 years. I've been mentoring teachers here for 21. I taught many of your children. I've taught some of those teachers behind me as well. Um, and it really is tough to come up here and talk about what we need or what we have. But I want to point out something. I have a sister-in-law that works at Delcy. We live next door. We're both Mrs. Wagner. We were hired the same year. Actually, they thought she would, they were hiring her here when I walked in the door. And over those years, now she's retired, I think two, when I look at my salary difference from theirs to mine, she made $166,500 more than we. We both have masters. We both are very scholarly people. Keep up to date, keep going. Now, when I got to that point, and I'm already realizing why she was able to retire and what she was doing. I knew, look, I'm at that top scale. And each year, if I was at Delphi, I'd be making 7,000 more. So if you look over the course of my thing, I have made over $200,000 less than any, not just my sister-in-law, but my, the other people. And I chose to stay here because I do love my job. I love my students. I love the community. I love the people I work with. So I'm asking you to please understand that we do love it. We want to stay. I want to be able to mentor new teachers and have them stay with us. They have in the past. So please, respect our team. They're doing it. They're representing us. And they are completely transparent. I appreciate your time. Good evening, my name is Catherine Town. I'm a TFEA member and been a teacher in this district for 23 years. Again, taught many uh, of your children and some of the teachers behind me as well. Um, it's an honor to serve with such fine teachers. And I just wanted to say that I support our TFEA negotiations team and I give them all the authority to speak for me and I appreciate the fact that they do. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jen Cockrell and I am a TFEA member. I have been working in Franklin Township since 2002. 
My weekly instructional minutes are 1,450 and I am currently compensated at $76,603. If I worked at Delcy School District, my weekly instructional minutes would be 1,230, and I would be making $89,334 on Delcy Step 15, which is the top of their salary guide. And I would also like to say I fully um, trust my negotiating team. Please settle. Hi. Good evening, Sue Buriak, President TFEA. Franklin Township resident. I've been here for 22 years. I wasn't going to speak tonight because I'm actually enjoying the fact that the people that I voice for every month um, are speaking up and they're being honest. And it's hard for a lot of people to come up here and speak to you, Mr. Brandt, and to your board. Um, it's, it's not that hard for me, but I appreciate that they're standing up and speaking in front of you. And I hope that you are hearing them. Um, and I hope that we can move forward with our negotiations. And I fully support my negotiations team. Thank you. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, what's that? I've been working all weekend uh, to help get it passed. Um, you know, it's pass soon, or what's that? You think it'll be passed soon? Hopefully, so we can get the districts who are um, negatively impacted by S2 to to um, recoup up to sixty five percent of them, their funding that they lost. Absolutely. Okay. I'm just wondering what the position of the NJA was on the bill. Uh, the NJA has been advocating that for weeks. Yeah, we support it well. So we can that the Absolutely. Budget. Hopefully, we do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my name is Tony Capello. I'm the Uniserve uh, consultant from NJA, assigned to assist the TFEA for negotiations. Um, normally, we don't speak at public board meetings. I really like the association and the board to handle their things kind of internally. However, there were some statements made last board meeting and this board meeting that have to be addressed. There's a foundational statement in this country, and it is you have to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yeah. And the reason that's foundational is because any piece of the truth, withholding any little bit of the truth, can mislead the public, and it's certainly not right. And it's certainly not fair to the community who inherently have to trust what their elected officials say, it's also not fair to some of the board members who may not be in the room during these times. It's also unfair to the dedicated staff of the TFEA and the support staff when these issues occur. So I'm gonna address some of the comments made and then we're gonna go line by line. Last month's board meeting, it was stated by some board member, I do not know who, that the board provided a proposal in October and that the TFEA has been delaying negotiations. That is absolutely, absolutely incorrect. The fact of the matter is, we met November 28th, and the TFEA provided a counter proposal with language items and salary to be considered by the board. We have not heard anything since. Okay, can I stop you uh, the November 28th meeting, um, the board met with the association Right. And said, did you review our counter proposal? Is that no, that's not accurate. The meeting ended because we got into a discussion around salary guides. The board has proposed salary guides, which you mentioned reduces the total number of steps to 16, right? That is a part truth. The whole truth to that statement is that even though those salary guides are only 16 steps, 87.4% of the members would not move in two years. They would not progress to the top of the guide for two out of the three years that you proposed. 
we had those discussions. In fact, the meeting ended when it said, oh, we got to get the salary guides right. That's how the meeting ended. Um, again, we had a Saturday meeting on January 7th. That was the next time. We discussed options. Um, can't come to an agreement on salary guides. Well, here's the thing. The reason you can't come to an agreement on salary guides is that we have not agreed to a percentage in order to apply to those salary guides. You have to agree to the percentage first, and then you can create the salary guides. That's how, that's how it works. I don't know how much time or taxpayer dollars you spent on having an outsider create your salary guides based on percentages that really don't exist. They're not nailed down. Um, we have not delayed these negotiations. We have been upfront. We have been honest with our members. We have shown them both guides. The guys that we proposed increased the starting salary the way the board wanted. We took into account some of the board's things that they wanted. We have not come to an agreement. That's why we're going to the next step because it's time to move the process along and get to that next step. Tony, have you been to every negotiation meeting that we've had? Not the ones where you and um, the superintendent met with the uh, TFEA negotiations chair and president. No, I was not there. Was there any other meetings you were not at that you were not in the room? That was not in the room. All negotiations meetings? Yeah. Um, Maybe one red right before meeting mediation. Okay. Um, Tony, you've been here for a while. Do you have any thoughts on the Tony Hawk but everything else that I've said has been absolutely fact, right? Where did I go wrong? I, I can't confirm the calculations uh, that I've been doing. But you, you came out and you insinuated that somebody lied. Can you identify the things you said about I am not going to call anybody out on a public board meeting of, of being a liar. I will say, I will say that it's misleading. It's misleading, right? So we said October, uh, the statement was made last board meeting that um, we were delaying, wow. we were delaying, and we did not provide a counter proposal to the Board of Education. When clearly, 1128, we did provide that counter proposal. You were in the room. So, I, I, got to, I have to clarify the dates here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. There was no mistake. Got it posed, went from 18 steps to 16 steps. Yeah. 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 It's not, it's, it, you, listen, we talk Go ahead. There, there, there's a conversation. But 18 to 16 is a fact. I didn't dispute that. You said it wasn't true. I and said it wasn't a whole truth. So I did say it was a fact. Mm -hmm. We grab this period and, and rehash and, and, and get into all the negotiations. But Mr. Branch said that this meeting was about the salary guys. And the guys that were proposed by the association in September. Right, a counter proposal in October are the, still the same guy that you proposed, you proposed in was February. February, March. Same guys. We didn't propose. We're, we're maintaining the position. Listen, you knew in January that we were not proposing new guides, and we should probably look. Uh, January. The conversation that's had the meeting was to get the counter proposal to the guys we presented you. No, 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 that's not, that is absolutely untrue. We did not create guides to counter propose. It was a discussion the on. Was to, to, to create new guides. It was absolutely to create new guides. It wasn't for you to give us the same exact guide. Why would we have this discussion in the first place? There's because your guys, you didn't understand your own guides. That's why. We understood the guide and we told you and we, we, we understood your concern and we were willing to have a conversation about it. We said, okay, you don't like our guides. Give us other guides so we can work from them. We're still waiting. But you also said you wanted other guides with certain conditions that the association is not willing to entertain at this point. Why That's why we're at fact finding. You knew that we, we spoke January 23rd on the phone right before the board meeting. And then you had another conversation with my colleague January 30th. February 2nd, I actually called the mediator, but I was told to hold off by the association because there was another meeting on February 7th with the board president and the superintendent. Did, did. That's, that's how that timeline went. So where were we delaying? We're not delaying, we're just saying we're holding our position. And then we need to move the fact on. And as a result of that Saturday meeting between your guy professional, our guy professional, uh, Mr. JT, were you in that meeting? I was not. Absolutely. Um, 
Did your, did your guy professional uh, prepare for alternative guys from the association? We have all kinds of uh, options for the association review. But in that meeting. And chose to resubmit a guy from six months ago. That was the decision of the association. In that meeting, we also we also agreed. In that meeting, we also agreed that it's really pointless to create salary guides when you don't have a percentage to create the salary guide with. Absolutely, we did. But, but, your, but your guy, professional, as a result of that meeting, per, did prepare and propose alternative guides to the association. We have that. That is common knowledge. That has been spoken about. Rejected and chose to resubmit a guide that was submitted six months ago. We just said we were maintaining our position. That's what that's what it was. Well, you didn't say you we're maintaining your position. We you clearly did. You could have said that, have said that in the Saturday meeting, we're maintaining our position. Okay. And then we wouldn't have we wouldn't have to have a conversation with them back. You actually resubmitted the guide. You, you didn't say we're maintaining our position. You resubmitted the guide that we had to then clarify to make sure that that was actually the right guide because it was the same exact guide you presented six months ago. You know why? Because we had already informed multiple weeks prior that we weren't presenting new guides. The, we, we literally did that, January 23rd. We, we had that conversation. All I'm asking, if there's a miscommunication, listen, it is what it is, but all I'm asking is that we be upfront and straight with each other. We don't say things like, the association bears 100% of the responsibility for the previous guides, because you know, Guides are mutually developed and agreed upon. That's the way the process works. I think Mr. Breaker's point was the salary guides were created by the association. That's just a general. I mean, I, not just here. In almost every mm -hmm. that, That's a fact. It does. It, it, it mean you have a guide team. Uh, so you do. And I think Mr. Breaker said. It, Words fall for just accepting the guides to the NJA prepared. Last time we were trying to fix them. And we worked towards that. And it takes multiple settings. Listen, Mr. Yuri, you met with them. You said you met with them. We'll tell you the same thing. I'm not saying anything that he wouldn't say. It takes multiple rounds of negotiation to fix the bad guys. As we tried to do last time, we didn't get to where we wanted to. We're trying again now to continue to fix those guides. I don't know if we're going to fix them all this time either. I hope we do. process. I've been in four, this is the fourth time I've been involved. And every time we settled over the past four, count them four, and I didn't finish this last time because I left, but I, but I picked up here. Four times I sat across the table with your representation. Most of, I don't know most of you now because most of the people I know are retired. And I'm going to tell you honestly, we have almost always yielded to the TFBA to do the guides the way that they felt was the most effective for their membership. We didn't get it wrong. Maybe we did now and then and we said, okay, good. And of course we agreed because we wanted it settled. We had faith. So don't sit here and say it's not, it, it is the onus is on the association, but we can fix it. I'm convinced we can fix this. I'm convinced that we can kind of find something in the middle. We absolutely cannot throw the amount of money you all want in every step. That's ridiculous. We can't do step one, five grand, and step whatever, five. We can't do that. You just propose that. Now, I know nobody's saying that, but I'm just saying, wouldn't it be great if we could? We have to do something to make this better. Yeah, they took baby steps last time. Maybe it's time to take big girl steps now, huh? And big boy steps. You know? It's time, I have faith. So this is, this is getting out of hand. The TFBA and us, we have to Work it out. fix the guy. That's the problem. We agree on the percentage, we have to fix the guy. And if we can't, we gotta go, as Mr. Craig said, to the back line. That's 
<laughs> That's where we're going. Right? So I've been through it all. For all of you out there, I've been through it with most of many of you know me and have been through it with me. So <laughs> thanks for your time. Look forward to hearing from you.